Next, got to move on to the to Clay Center data, and uh, there were Brangus in, in uh, used in a little bit of, of cycles three, which would go back, back cycle two thousand one to see our cattle populations. From Center breed comparisons that they have used Herford and Angus as sort of a benchmark throughout the study. And every cycle has had Herford sires, and every cycle has had Angus sires. And then in each cycle, then they bring other breeds to compare against those. And so that connects the, the data over the years. They use some of the same uh, actual Herford and Angus sires in time together as well. But in the cycle eight, the last cycle of it, they had looked at Herford and Angus. They all included Brangus, Beefmaster, then a couple of uh, tropically adaptable non and those two primarily because of the performance of those cattle Herford and Angus. The sires of those Brangus and Beefmaster sires are, are chosen out of were unproven sires or less proven sires, but now using more proven sire uh, bulls that were had widely used in AI and were important in their particular their breeds. They crossed them on, in previous years they used uh, some Herford Angus cows, this last cycle they used Angus cows, and then Mark III, which is a four breed composite, which is three quarter British and one quarter continental. They collected, uh, you know, one of the things about the Clay Center study is there's lots of data. They've got at least 100 steers per sire group, I think 110 to 120. So they've got large numbers and large populations. Uh, so it's done at Clay Center. Talked a little bit about the Creek Clay Center environment. And I think something that's important is not just the, the, uh, the uh, latitude of, of Clay Center and where it exists and whether the weather and some of those sort of things, but also the, in the season the way they're doing. They're spring calving, uh, but not winter calving. Uh, they're calving in, in March and April, they're weaning in September. And then these cattle are fed through the winter in Nebraska. Okay? But they're, they're placed on feed in October, they're harvested. The last of the cattle uh, in this study were harvested early in June over a, a two or three year period. Uh, but they did not feed through July and August. And uh, to me, that uh, I, guess, I guess my assumption is that had the cattle been a little, they, they go in as calf beds, not as yearlings. If they had lengthened them out a little bit, if they had gone to grass with them for a while, like we in the Flint Hills like to do, uh, and fed those cattle through August, uh, maybe, they did, maybe it would have been even more advantage to uh, the Brahman derivative breeds like Beefmaster and Brains. Uh, Angus Sire. <coughs> more Angus, a little more Angus, right? You paying attention? I always try to pull these kind of tricks on my students to see if they're paying attention. Now, most of you would probably say that's not an Angus sire steer, that's probably an Angus steer. And actually, all three of those were Angus sire steers. That I think there's a perception again that if we turn out a bull that's got a little more ear, all the calves are going to have just uh, just as much ear. Dr. Frick did a nice job of showing you some calves and and I just wanted to raise that point. This was the, the picture that, that Dr. Kendiff uh, provided. And as I look through that, there's a steer front and center that obviously has some ear influence. And whether he'd be docked or not, you know, you know your cell bar and operator's better than I do. But I would dare say that pretty much all the rest of the steers in that pen would not show enough ear to really be visually identified. So you know, that's, that's something I think for producers to understand. And I don't know, other than just demonstrations and lots of pictures, I don't know how you overcome that. But, but certainly, the, depending on the breed type of the dams, but if there's no problem influence in the cows and you're using 3 8 5 8 kind of bulls, uh, then I would say that the high percentage will, will merely go undetected, perhaps. Now, again, I'm focusing on just the carcass weight. There is uh, production data to go in there as well, but I was asked to talk about the carcass data. But you can dig into this, uh, these reports. Uh, I think everything is through the journal now. Some of them, I know they, have, they also have those uh, reports that are available on the MARC website, some of those sort of things too. Uh, I usually start with those because they're all in pounds and not kilograms. Uh, but you can see here the harvest weight, for example, there were some significant differences uh, with the Beefmasters being the heaviest, uh, Angus coming in there, and then some, some distance back, some significant difference. Beefmaster was significantly heavier uh, than either Herford or Brangus with Angus somewhat intermediate. That trend carried over a little bit into the carcass, but not quite as much. Brangus, interestingly enough, uh, had the highest dressing percentage. Usually we associate higher dressing percentages with fatter cattle. Uh, I'll skip forward to just show you that, but that's not necessarily the case. And here that actually the Brangus cattle uh, were significantly better for yield grade than Herford, or excuse me, than, than, uh, than Angus, and also uh, better than, than Beefmaster, overlapped a little bit with the Herfords. But uh, for the Brangus cattle dressing so well and having a higher dressing percentage, I don't have a full explanation for that in terms of why they would dress so well even though they were leaner. But uh, they were the leanest of the, of the three groups significantly leaner than ever except Herford, and also have the largest ribeyes, 
Well, another one of those kind of perceptions is that your cattle don't, don't have the muscle, don't have the ribeye, that sort of thing. But in those four breeds, uh, in play center, when uh, they analyzed their data, they're actually uh, significantly larger than, than all three of the others. They were the largest, of those four breeds, they were the largest ribeye breed in, in, in the group. Let me go back to the, to the quality grade. Uh, Angus comes out on top, that's no surprise. They always do uh, in, in play center and elsewhere. They had certainly a, a dominant position in the industry in terms of marbling uh, But Beyond that, the, the differences uh, between Hereford for Angus Beefmaster, uh, that, that uh, Beefmaster comes out a little bit behind Hereford, Frangus overlaps with Hereford, so there's, that's the way they rank. Percent choice also similar. Uh, Angus was the highest, Hereford and Brangus basically the same, and then Beefmaster a little bit further back. Talked about the yield grade and the ribeye area advantages that are there. What about shear curves? Angus is the most tender in this particular group. Uh, but there were trends, uh, definitely Angus superior to, to Hereford and also to the other ear breeds. But again, Brangus not exactly the, the overlap with, with Beefmaster, but certainly a uh, trend going there in that direction. Sensory taste score is also the same. The, the panel is able to pick out the Angus as being different, uh, but not picking out the others. Flavor, uh, sort of followed marbling somewhat. Uh, juiciness, uh, fairly similar, a little bit of difference, uh, but not a whole lot. Brangus actually a little better than Beefmaster for juiciness. Now, I tried to, you know, one of the problems with, with looking at, at the play center cycle is that you've got a, a fixed group of breeds that you're comparing and we'd like to tie it across, all across. And, and so what I did was take the cycle seven and the cycle eight and put those together and sort of set Hereford and Angus as the benchmark and then derive the other breeds from them. And so this is the shear force deviation from the average of, Hank, of Angus Hereford uh, with some common sires, not a perfect analysis, they're actually now releasing the crossbreed uh, calculations for carcass traits, and you can look at those. Brangus, I believe, is in there, and so you can uh, look at those and see as well, and that would give you pretty similar results uh, if you want to do maybe an even more precise breed comparison and see. Uh, what I tend to do with a lot of producer groups is to take each breed average and put them on, for example, the Angus scale or the Charlotte scale, uh, and that gives you a, maybe an even, more, uh, even sharper uh, breed comparison. But as I take how each breed deviated from Angus Hereford, that for sheer force, the Angus Hereford uh, average of those two was the most tender, with Red Angus just a little bit behind. Red Angus is actually between Angus and Hereford uh, individually. Scimitol comes next, Charlet, uh, and Limousine, and then Brangus right there. But, but uh, Brangus looks favorable uh, to Gelby. Gelby is significantly tougher. They would be in the cycle seven, but compared to that benchmark, uh, and again, Beefmaster falls a little bit lower. Sort of the same thing that when you see across the cycles and you look how they can deviate from the population average or from the, the baseline, from the Angus Hereford uh, baseline. Red Angus higher than the average of Angus and Hereford, not quite as high as Black Angus, but higher than Hereford. But Angus falls right in there, right in there between Simital and Charlet, very similar, both in terms of marbling score and in terms of, of percent choice, with Beefmaster being a little further down than some of the others. So, you know. It would be nice to have uh, Brangus head to head with some of those other continentals, but I think the sort of the take home message is that, that how they compare in their cycles is pretty similar and when you do the across breed calculations, really Brangus not much different than a lot of the continental breeds that we see out there in terms of their carcass quality and in their shear force. Uh, appear generally to be favorable to Beefmaster in, in the comparison that we have there. <coughs> so I, in my summary of, of that data and, and GPE 7 and 8 is that very similar to continental breeds for shear force marbling and percent choice. And, you know, I, I think about, again, those steers being <coughs> harvested June at the last. What if we fed those cattle through the summer? What if we fed them in Texas? Uh, that, you know, we, we see papers coming out talking about stress and stress on marbling and those sort of things. And, and, and I think we all realize those are real. And, and, and so certainly that if we'd have fed those cattle through the summer as yearlings in Texas, it would have been interesting at least to see how those might have come up. And, and to see if that adaptability that is no doubt there is a cow, wouldn't that carry on into the steers as well? <coughs>